Call, call this meeting to order. The invocation is going to be done by Ms. Linda Thompson. Let us pray. Almighty and wise Father, we come this morning asking that you rest, rule, and abide in this room. That you give our leaders the courage and wisdom and compassion to run the business of this county. That you impact us all with your grace and your mercy. And that you keep us safe from all hurt, harm, and danger. Be with us during this season of Thanksgiving, that it is not only a day, but it is a reason to live, to be grateful and thankful that we live in a caring and loving community. Bless us and keep us this day. Amen. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Please take the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Does anyone want to pull anything from the consent agenda? Mr. Chair, I'd like to pull item number six, please. Okay. Six, like Mr. Barker. That's right, yeah. Thanks. Just want to bring special attention to the fact that we, along with other members of our MPO, the Metropolitan Planning Organization, uh, which is the advisory board, the NCDOT, are all in solidarity in supporting a resolution, supporting NCDOT grant application for the U.S. Department of Transportation's Bridge Investment Program for the replacement of the Kafer Memorial Bridge. <clears throat> Our goal is really to find ways to get some federal dollars to come in or state dollars to come in to help mitigate the costs for the bridge. The last thing that I want to see is a toll bridge going in and out of, the, of our community, the main road that comes in and out. And so I wholeheartedly support uh, this application for this grant. Hopefully we'll get it. There will be some matching funds required, which each local jurisdiction will be required to submit some resources to that once it's received. And I believe that we're going to get this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I apologize for the mistake. It was number five. Uh, apparently there's two different lists. Uh, so if we could pull number five off the consent agenda, I'd appreciate it. Uh, and number five, I, I believe we have... Uh, Ms. Cecilia Pierce here. I know you're there. Oh, shoot. You were hiding behind that. Yeah, I, my hiding view. behind the podium. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, Thanks for having me in. Um, so item number five is the Trillium Health Resources Bottle Tax Report. So just um, to share a little bit about uh, the report that we provide. Um, and again, my name is Cecilia Pierce. I'm the Southern Regional Director with Trillium Health Resources. So thank you, um, Chair and Commissioners, for allowing me to talk for a few minutes. Um, so each year uh, through Trillium, through New Hanover County's bottle tax, um, you share those funds with Trillium to put towards uh, substance use prevention and treatment efforts. So with those funds, um, which we budgeted for about $100,000, I think the um, total amount was closer to 150. We usually don't find that out until closer to the end of the year. Um, but with those funds, we were able to support uh, some long-term residential recovery uh, for New Hanover County residents. $126,360 was paid for 2,808 bed days to Healing Transitions in Wake County. Um, so Healing Transitions is very similar to the Healing Place, which you all have heard a lot about. Um, before the Healing Place opened, when folks needed long-term residential recovery, we, we would refer them to uh, Healing Transitions in Raleigh. And then once the Healing Place opened up here in New Hanover County, we paid an additional $248,715 for 5,527 bed days for New Hanover County residents to receive long-term recovery and uh, non-medical detox at the, the Healing Place. We also purchased 250 naloxone kits um, to prevent opioid overdose in New Hanover County residents. Um, that amounted to $13,300, uh, and those were provided to the health department and the sheriff's office. On the prevention side, we purchased the sold-out youth 
online curriculum that talks about fentanyl and the dangers of fentanyl, and it's directed towards high school students. Uh, any parents in the audience um, of both middle school and high school students probably received a notice that that curriculum was available, both to students and parents, and that's being offered through the schools, and that was a uh, cost of $10,000. And then for middle school parents in particular, um, we covered four, uh, three sessions with the Post Center. Um, and the Post Center provides substance use prevention education to parents. It covers things like uh, adolescent brain development, um, how kids are exposed to drug and alcohol use through social media, things that parents need to know in keeping their children safe. So we are providing three sessions to New Hanover County parents um, at a cost of $1,950. So that actually amounts to more than we receive from New Hanover County, but when we see a need somewhere, we look for other sources of funding to complement the funds from the bottle tax report, uh, from the bottle tax that we receive from the county. Um, in that report, we also include information about uh, the folks who are uninsured and receive state-funded services, so you can see kind of the entire scope of the effort um, for treatment and prevention in New Hanover County. <clears throat> Cecilia, uh, sorry, were you finished? I, yep, that was, uh, that was the information on the bottle tax report. Okay. Uh, Cecilia, also I know that um, there has been some major structural changes to Trillium uh, overall. And uh, the reason I asked to have this polled was not only to hear that about the bottle tax, but if you could give us a very brief overview um, and explain what the ramifications for here in New Hanover County will mean with these changes. It's rather dramatic. It, there are some significant changes uh, that have occurred over the last couple months. Um, as part of the state budget legislation, the DHHS secretary was directed to reduce the number of local management entities and managed care organizations down to a maximum of five and uh, potentially down to four. So there was an existing proposal by two LMEMCOs, Sand Hills and East Point, to merge. That was submitted to the state um, on August 1st of this year. On November 1st, Secretary Kinsley issued a secretarial directive that will dissolve Sand Hills and leaves East Point as the surviving entity um, with that merger and East Point will re receive eight of the 11 Sand Hills counties. Uh, those are Davidson County, Harnett County, and Rockingham County are going to other LMEMCOs. Um, along with that, East Point will consolidate with Trillium. Uh, that is the, um, what the directive uh, says, and the consolidated LMEMCO will have 46 counties. So that, in terms of the number of counties, will be the largest LMEMCO in the state. Um, in terms of the timeline for these things happening, um, this, this is the Secretary's plan, and it has a very tight timeline. So the go live for that entire consolidation is February 1st of next year. Um, so last Friday, the LMEMCOs that are a part of this consolidation were required to submit a consolidation plan. And then by December 1st, consolidation agreements are due to the state. Um, and we will get feedback from the secretary uh, in terms of approval of those plans and those agreements. So just wanted to share, um, obviously during this time of change, Trillium is really focused on providing continuity of care to the members here in our existing counties and new counties that we will be working in. Our teams are preparing to operate in all 46 counties starting on February 1st of next year. Um, in the event that the secretary approves all of the plans that I've talked about. Trillium obviously has experience both with consolidation. Um, Coastal Care and ECBH consolidated to create Trillium. And we also have experience absorbing counties from other LME MCOs. So we feel like we are very prepared to execute the plan that we have shared with the secretary. Um, we really want to ensure members continue to receive the care that they need when they need it, both in our existing regions and in the new counties that we will be serving. We're working with our providers to grow our network to make sure that folks receive the care where they are um, and to make sure that claims get paid on time. We could not do the work that we do to support our members without our provider network. 
Um, and so just in terms of continuity for you all um, and the work that we do together as partners and stakeholders, the plan is for me to continue as your regional director. And the plan is also for you to continue to get support from some of our other stakeholder facing staff. Um, we have a head of DSS engagement uh, that will continue to work in New Hanover County and with our other counties. We have a head of Department of Juvenile Justice engagement and we have an ED disposition team that works with the emergency department at Novant as well as other emergency departments. So there are some things in place that we, um, that we plan to continue to offer New Hanover and our other counties to maintain that continuity of care and the ongoing relationships that we have. Cecilia, in, in practice, uh, if I have my numbers right, it means that we will go in Trillium from 28 counties to 46 counties That's in correct. the eastern part of North Carolina and providing the Medicaid services for those 46 counties. And for my fellow commissioners who I know, you know I represent uh, ourselves on Trillium, this is a, a, a major change. Uh, New Hanover County continues to be the largest contributor to Trillium of those 46 counties. We have a serious uh, stake in Trillium here as they've gone into what's almost 100% expansion uh, and in a very, very tight you know, time frame to make this happen. I just wanted Cecilia to kind of give the news uh, the, uh, to all of us yourselves and we'll be uh, you know, watching this really carefully uh, and so that our interests in New Hanover County are you know, clearly are you know, put at the top. Mr. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes, sir. Cecilia, I know that this is above your pay grade, but I have watched this whole progression for the last 15 years now. Mm -hmm. When I first got on the board in 2008, <clears throat> there was Southeastern Mental Health mm -hmm. that covered New Hanover, Pender, and Brunswick County. And at that time, you had folks that actually provided service locally here, many mom and pop operations, so to speak, and the state decided to expand. And what I saw then was smaller companies being put out of business because the state wanted someone that could provide a, an array of services versus one or two services. And so you had a lot of folks that were financially affected in a negative way. And they were looking to groups like Coastal Horizons and others that could take a much larger array of, uh, uh, provide a, a large array of services. Um, people used to come to this community in particular because of the great mental health services that we provided. But that's changed, in my opinion, along the way. Uh, when my father served as a commissioner back in the 80s, Southeast Mental Health again provided direct services to the citizens here, which is not really the case anymore in a large part. Um, you know, I know that it doesn't matter whether it's a Republican or Democrat regime in, in Raleigh, this progression has been taking place for a while now. And my concern is that as we expand, to me, you water down services mm -hmm. uh, to where as much as you try to give people the same level of services, it's not happening. And as rich of a community as we are in our community, we lack so much when it comes to mental health providers. And I'm speaking from personal, familiar experience in trying to find resources that just aren't here, where you've got to go to other communities and other cities, you know, two and three and four hours away to get the things that we should have here in New Hanover County. I heard you say the numbers about how much money is, you know, coming from the ABC bottle tax. More important, I want to hear, you know, and, and let folks know that the county contributes to, to a great extent to Trillium locally, uh, the funding of the healing place were county dollars. Uh, the building of that building were county dollars. Uh, we're helping through, as a pastoral agency with Trillium, you know, fund the day-to-day -day operational costs of the healing place. Uh, they have a, 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 a setup where they should have a board that would raise monies to provide, you know, for some of their services, but the county is pretty much carrying the freight for the healing place. And I, want, I don't want anyone to walk away not understanding exactly how we contribute uh, to the services here in our community. And my goal is that people get what they need. Uh, you know, it's, for me, it's disappointing that Raleigh and those in General Assembly have chosen to, again, water down and water down and water down the services that so many folks are needing. When we constantly see in the media, you see athletes and others that are dealing with mental health issues, but still we keep turning a blind eye or deaf ear to the fact that we need to help individuals uh, with those challenges. So I commend you for the work you're doing. Uh, I know that you got a lot on your shoulders and hopefully you'll get the cavalry coming to really give you more assistance than what you really have right now. But thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion? 
Mr. Chair, yes, sir. I will make a motion, but I just want to recognize our friends from the Azalea Festival, Allison Berenger, Michael Franklin, for being here. I don't need you to talk. Thanks for always being a good partner to us here at the county. With that, all of those comments being considered, I move the consent agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 There's a lot of folks that showed up for things today that you aren't going to have to talk about, but thank you for coming. And, and Mr. Chair, if I can take a point of personal privilege, I know we're about to acknowledge uh, our county employees. We have one employee, I think, that's been here 35 years, maybe, or 40. And um, when you see Margaret, who works in the library, just know that she was also on Jeopardy. And she was outstanding on Jeopardy as well. So we have a Jeopardy contestant right here in the audience today. National recognition throughout the whole entire world. Woo-hoo! Let's hear from Margaret. Commissioners, good morning. It's an honor and a privilege to be with you, but, but it's always partic particularly special on this Monday when we get a chance to introduce to you new employees, recognize those that have reached significant milestones, and we are going to have a special recognition this morning. And in some months, we recognize folks that are retiring. I'm, I'm happy to report that your moratorium on retirement remains. There is no one here that is retiring this morning. And so we're, we're thankful for that. I enjoy all parts of this. Usually, though, it's with a little regret when we're recognizing folks that are retiring. And so we're going to begin with service awards. And we're going to start with 10 years this morning, a significant milestone in service to the board and our community. And it's an honor to have worked with all of these folks in the time that they've been here, because I've been lucky enough to be part of the organization while they've been here. When I call your name, if, if you would, please come forward. I want to be the first to shake your hand and then invite you to visit with the board and have your picture made afterward. And so first this morning, with 10 years of service, uh, New Hanover County Department of Social Services, Sheila Atkins. Sheila, congratulations and thank you for being a part of this organization. Commissioners, also with 10 years of service this morning with the new Hanover County Sheriff's Office, Daniel Sogi. Daniel, thank you for what you do. Thank you so very much. We're going to move forward and recognize one individual who has 15 years of service to New Hanover County and New Hanover County Health Department, Julia Wiles. Julia, congratulations and thank you for what you do. we're going to recognize an employee who has 20 years of outstanding service to New Hanover County in 911, Karen Benton. Karen, thank you and congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. 
commissioners, we're going to move forward to 25 years of service, and we've got two folks with us this morning that have provided 25 years of outstanding service. The first in Health and Human Services, the Administration Division, Margaret Eaton. Margaret, thank you for what you do, and congratulations. also with 25 years of service with the Department of Social Services, Melita Newkirk. <laughs> Melita, congratulations and thank you for what you do. So commissioners, uh, Commissioner Barfield alluded to this, but, but we've got a person with us this morning that this is really special. This is very rare air and still an outstanding employee going hard every day with 40 years of service in the New Hanover County Public Library, Margaret Miles. 40 <laughs> years. Margaret, again, thank you for, for everything that you've done and everything that you continue to do. Commissioners, there's a lot of good people that we just had a chance to recognize with significant service milestones. I, I wish the board would lead us in another round of applause. They, they all very much deserve that. Okay, so. We're going to get a chance to introduce to you folks that have joined the team since we last were together on this particular Monday, some outstanding public employees. And, and I say it every month because it's the truth. We, we only hire the best and the brightest, but they're also committed and passionate about public service. And that's what the differentiator is. There are a lot of smart, a lot of talented people. There's a lot of people that want to work in this community. But it's rare to find the talent and the passion and the commitment to public service. And that's what it takes to have a long-term career with us. And so when I call your name, if you would stand up, we want to recognize you properly with a round of applause. And so first this morning, uh, in the Department of Social Services, Bianca Bowen. Bianca, thank you for joining the team. Also with the Department of Social Services, LaTanya Boynton. Tanya, thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you for joining the team. With Community Justice Services, Kelly Coughlin. Kelly, thank you for joining. The New Hanover County Department of Social Services, Nina Crow. Crow, Nina, congratulations. Thank you for joining us. Also in the Department of Social Services, Rose Davis. Rose, thank you for coming to work with us. Also in the Department of Social Services, Allison Lee. Allison, thank you. In our engineering department, Derek Shrewsbury. Derek, thank you for coming to work with us. Good to see you way over there. Also in the Department of Social Services, Tiffany Smith. Tiffany, thank you for coming to work with us. Soil and Water, Jessica Stitt. Jessica, thank you. 
Department of Social Services, William Wilburn. <laughs> William, good morning, and thank you for being here. Commissioners, I believe that concludes service awards and recognition of new hires. And so thank you for giving us the chance to present. Thank you. Next is consideration and adoption of awareness, Adoption Awareness Month Proclamation. <clears throat> Whereas every child deserves to grow up in a loving, stable family, yet sadly many children in America have parents who are unwilling or unable to care for them. And whereas more than 113,000 children in the United States, 2,786 children in North Carolina, and 33 children in New Hanover currently in New Hanover County are currently in foster care awaiting to be adopted. And whereas for our children who have lost their birth families, adoption can provide, uh, can provide the home life, parental love, nurturing, and security that they would otherwise be missing. And whereas North Carolina's future depends on today's children and the state is committed to helping all children reach their full potential in supportive families. And whereas North Carolina encourages citizens, community agencies, religious organizations, businesses, and others to celebrate adoption, honor the families that grow through adoption, and focus attention on those children who live with the burden of an uncertain future while they await permanent families. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the New Hanover County Board of Commissioners that November 23rd, November 2023, will be recognized as Adoption Awareness Month in New Hanover County, adopted this 20th day of November 2023. Mr. Chair, as a member of the Health and Human Services Board, I move approval of the proclamation. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, thanks for having us. My name is Tiffany Bickle. I am the uh, Adoption Supervisor here at New Hanover County Health and Human Services. Currently, we have around 249 children in foster care. Of those children, 33 currently have the legal plan of, are legally cleared for adoption or waiting for that adop those adoptions to be finalized. Of those 33, we have um, 13 that need an adoptive home. And so a large two thirds are in adoptive homes and somewhere in the process of adoption. And then we have about 13 that we're actively recruiting for adoptive homes. So the state sets forward each year a baseline for us to try to achieve based on population and the number of adoptions completed the year before. This year for New Hanover County, that baseline is, is 24 adoptions. And thus far, um, about halfway through, we have, we have finalized 19 adoptions. I think there's something, I'm Brian Bachnick, the program manager at New Hanover County DSS in foster care and adoptions. And I think there's something that we need to remember. There's a certain bittersweet aspect of uh, adoptions and child welfare. The bitter is the uh, chronic neglect that got most of the kids up to this table, but the sweet is the finality and the family that they get through the process of adoption and child welfare. So I'm thankful for Tiffany and the rest of the team that do a wonderful job working with our judge and with the local attorneys to try and fast track this process to make it help us get to permanence as quickly as we can. So uh, thank you for taking this time to uh, recognize uh, and uh, make adoption awareness on everybody's mind. Thank you. Mr. Thank Chair. You. Yes, sir. Folks, quick question for you. What are other ways that members of the community can help make a difference whenever it comes to an endeavor like this, such an important thing? Not everyone can adopt, but how else can they help? I mean, I think the focus is, is our older youth. Of those 13 that I shared with you, um, th they're all over the age of 10. So while everyone can't open their homes to, to adopt, um, there needs to be more focus on fostering older youth. There needs to be focus on mentorship of those older youth. Um, with those older youth come, you know, longer periods of time where they're spend, 
exposure to more trauma, which makes them behaviorally and, and with mental health more challenging. I think to, to get to the specifics and the nuts and bolts, we lost about 30% of all of our foster parents uh, throughout the COVID times. That was devastating for us because the children uh, continue to come into um, child welfare and to foster care. So we struggle to find uh, foster parents to place some of these children. Tiffany talked about some of our older children, but in general, we, we need to bolster up our fostering community. Um, so if there's anybody that wants to open up their hearts and homes to foster, just call the uh, Department of Social Services, ask for Tiffany or Brian uh, or Alice, and we'll be happy to get you started. Thank you for the work that you all and your team do. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Brian, you've been doing this work for a long time. Uh, I just want to say thank you, number one, but also I'm glad to hear the numbers are actually down. I think yeah. we're at an all-time high of close to 400 kids in foster care at one point in time, so to see the number in the mid-200s, I think, uh, shows you all have done great work there in finding <coughs> homes and, and also working with parents to make sure they can take care of their kids in a better manner. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. You too. What we got to bring in? Brian. Next is a public hearing on Mason Inlet Special Assessment. I will now open a public hearing to receive comments on Mason's Inlet Special Assessment. The Board of Commissioners adopted a resolution on October the 16th, 2023 for the Mason Inlet Relocation Project that determined $4,069,039 needs to be assessed for operational and maintenance costs of the project. The board directed county staff to prepare a preliminary assessment role and a project map mailed to each owner a notice of hearing and schedules and schedule a public hearing to consider the preliminary assessment role. North Carolina General Statute 1538-195 requires that the board conduct a public hearing to hear all interested persons with respect to preliminary assessment role. The board will now hear many public comments. Anyone here to speak? Okay. Um, I will now close. Do you have something? I've got a recap of a few slides, but we just looked at this last month, and yeah. I, at your direction, we can forego I'll, those. I'll close. So okay. I'll let go. So I will close the public hearing. Is there a motion to approve Mason Inlet Special Assessment? So moved. A second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Ms. Brothers reminded me we do just need to approve the terms of the of the payment. Um, I can just uh, I'll okay. just go to the last slide if that's okay. Yes, sir. This is the schedule. Um, once approved, we will mail the bills on December the 11th. We. Uh, provide the citizens six months to make the payments interest-free until June 30th of 2024. And should they choose an installment plan, we've typically set a five-year uh, annual payment schedule with an interest rate of 7%. We would propose those terms. That's been the same terms that have been pro uh, proposed at every prior assessment. We propose carrying those terms forward for this one as well. Okay. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Uh, Eric, uh, I know this means going backwards a little bit, but I uh, I think it's important for our citizens to understand, you know, the uniqueness of this program. And uh, just you know, by saying the Mason Inlet Relocation Maintenance Program, it sounds like a lot of government speak. Could you give us a very, very brief overview of exactly what this means and the importance to our coastal community here? I mean, it's, it's a pretty neat 
it's, it's really important. Sure. So um, these are a couple of pictures from back in 2002. The one on the left shows the Shell Island getting dangerously close to the inlet. And then there was a major community effort that was brought together along with the commissioners to come up with a plan to re relocate the push the inlet back further north. And you can see it was in the right picture it was pushed north about 3,000 feet uh, to uh, provide safety and renourishment to the beach. Um, over time, just the natural tendency in the environment is the sand shifts from Figure Eight Island and migrates southward towards Wrightsville Beach and into Mason Inlet. This is what the inlet looked like in July. We're just getting ready to start a new um, uh, inlet, inlet maintenance here in just a month or so. And this is what it looked like back in July. The, the, the true inlet should be about 500 feet north of this to the left. And you can see sort of all the sand accumulating in the inlet. So this is kind of a win-win for Figure 8 and Wrightsville Beach. The, 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 the Figure 8 loses the sand and it comes down to Wrightsville Beach and the sand gets pumped back into Figure 8 and re-nurtures that beach while at the same time providing a healthy inlet um, between uh, Wrightsville Beach and Figure 8. No, no permanent cost to the taxpayers. The county fronts the initial cost and then every five years we accumulate all the costs since the last assessment and um, assess that to the benefited property owners. And Linda Brothers here does a great job of getting that roll pulled together and computed and sending out the notices. So, mm -hmm. so Eric, this is all paid for by the citizens uh, who benefit. Yes, sir. By that. Thank you, I just wanted to. And, and if I might we, add a comment to that, you're exactly right, it's paid for um, by those property owners, but it is open for all the public to use. I was out there, um, about a month ago, and it is terribly shallow. I would say there were areas that are Im impassable, 100% impassable. Uh, I was surprised to see that. So not only is it just for those property owners, but all the public can use the, that inlet. Yes, ma'am. Anyone else? Thank you, Eric. Next is a presentation of New Hanover County Water Quality Monitoring Program 2022-23 final report. Brad? M Mr. Oh, Chairman, yes, sir. I, it, perhaps I missed it, but I don't know that the board actually voted on the terms that Eric presented. Okay. There was a motion that was I, yeah, I interpreted the motion to be but inclusive was, of all of But that. I don't believe there was an actual vote. Yeah. I'll make the motion, sir, that we include the terms presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Sir. Yes, sir. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and other commissioners. I, I'm pleased to be back again. Uh, my firm, well, first, my name is Brad Rosov. I'm a marine biologist with a firm, Coastal Protection Engineering, right here in Wilmington. And so our firm has been monitoring the water quality within many of the tidal creeks in New Hanover County since 2007. So this is... Uh, I'm honored and privileged to be back for the 16th time giving you all our uh, annual report, a summary of our annual report. We, we monitor uh, on an annual basis and we come and provide you all a report each and every year to update you on the status of the water quality within New Hanover County. So what I'll do in this uh, brief presentation is kind of go over some of the results from this past year and let you know a little bit about some other initiatives that we've been uh, working on beyond our typical regular monitoring regime. Mr. Chairman, Brad, before you get started, this says final report. This is not your final report for us, just the final Not my issue. final, final. The annu final annual report. You'll Good. hopefully see me back here next year, too, Good. Mr. Barfield. So I'll just jump right into a little bit of, of what we do and how we do it, and then I'll get into some of these results. And first of all, as you can see, a, a map that should be fairly familiar to you on the screen there, which shows the delineation of a number of watersheds within the county. We monitor from within eight of the Tidal Creek watersheds in New Hanover County, stemming from the south at Lords Creek all the way up north to Island Creek, where we've added some samples over the, or sampling sites over the past several years. So all in all, we're monitoring a total of eight Tidal Creeks, and we spend our time moder monitoring a total of 20 individual sampling sites within those eight Tidal Creeks. So some of the Tidal Creeks, we just have one sampling site. Some of them we have up to four. So we're getting a good snapshot of these eight individual tidal creeks when we go out there each time. We're also monitoring within uh, Airly Gardens, which is not a tidal creek, it's rather a, a freshwater lake. Um, it spills out into Bradley Creek, that's where it discharges, but we also monitoring three sites within that lake as well. 
So that's a little bit of the geographic uh, distribution of what we're doing and, and where we're doing it. But now I'll tell you just a little bit briefly about what we actually do. So we go out on a monthly basis, um, 12 months out of the year, once a month, we hit up each of those 20 sites. And when we go out there, we're going on, from the Tidal Creek point of view at least, we're going on that same tidal cycle. Uh, you know, I repeat this to you guys each year, so those who have heard this a uh, little more season, you've heard this, the newer faces, uh, you know, we have a report as well that's in your agenda packet, so if you have any questions, of course, I could feel that. But we, we go out, we collect the water on the same tidal cycle, on the high ebb, so the water's high in the creek and it starts to fall. That's when we collect our water samples as best we can. Because we have so many sites, we have to break this up into three sampling days, because you can't be all at one place at one time, of course. It's probably why I love this project so much. I get out from behind my desk, and I get to go out in the field. And so we get to go visit some of these sites via boat where we need to, and others we can just drive around town. We can access them by the side of the road off of culverts and in the stream bank and such. Um, but we go out, like I said, once a month, we collect these uh, samples. We collect some water samples that are analyzed in an analytical lab. We collect water samples that are analyzed for chlorophyll A, which is basically an indicator of algal blooms. We also collect water samples that are analyzed for what's called enterococcus bacteria. You've probably heard of E. coli and there's other kind of pretty well-known names of bacteria. This is a different suite. It's a very good indicator for any sort of human health concerns within the creek from any sort of maybe human source of sewage contamination. The EPA has done studies when you see a certain level, a certain number of this bacteria, when it's in the water column, it's an indicator that you can have a human health concern, that if you recreate or swim or consume food from it, you could get sick. So there's a correlation there. So that's why we have a standard for that enterococcus bacteria as well. So we collect those water samples, but we also just dip our probe into the water where we can get some instantaneous data on dissolved oxygen, turbidity, chlor um, uh, conductivity, salinity, temperature, and the like. So we collect all this data um, instantaneously when we do it. We also collect water samples for some of these what we call chemical parameters. We do this at Airly Garden, and these are nutrients parameters. We're not concerned about the bacteria. People don't swim in the lake there. People aren't recreating or eating shellfish. But we are concerned with algal blooms. Nutrients, when we see high levels of nutrient nutrients, it can feed algal blooms. So collectively, that's what we're doing each time we head out there. So jumping right to the chase here, this is in the report that we submitted to you all, our final report for this past year. Here are our summary results. What we've been able to do is basically take all this empirical data, all these numbers, and we can whittle it down to a pretty simple denominator for you, which is good, fair, or poor for each of these parameters that have standards attributed to them. Good meaning that we've had less than 10% of an exceedance of a standard over that given year. Fair is when we have between 10 to 25% of the samples collected were uh, above that, sta of that standard that was imposed for that parameter. And finally, poor would be if we had more than 25% of the time, more than a quarter of the samples exceeded that standard. So the good news is, you look on the screen here, I see a lot of green. You're seeing a lot of green, a lot of good. That, that's in indicative of good water quality. So turbidity and chlorophyll across the board for each of those eight tidal creeks were good. We did see in dissolved oxygen a couple pours on there and a couple fares. Um, that's not necessarily unusual. We'll see a lot of variation with dissolved oxygen on an annual basis. Some creeks have had perpetually worse dissolved oxygen than others. Sometimes that's also just the makeup of that tidal creek. Some of them have a little bit slower water flow. They're a little swampier, so to speak. And by nature, some of these creeks have a little bit lower dissolved oxygen. But we do keep our finger on the pulse and look at that there. I will note Island Creek, as you'll see there, they have poor dissolved oxygen right now. We added Island Creek. This past year, we have about two sampling sites there, maybe about uh, six months prior, we added the first one. And the idea there was to keep an eye on, on a finger on the pulse and really to establish a baseline for Island Creek. We hadn't been monitoring it previously. There's a lot of potential new developmental pressure in that area from residential homes. There's large developments coming in. So we wanted to look at that, that uh, water quality within the creek starting now before that development really occurs so we can see any changes over time. In Tarakakis at the very bottom, you can see it looks pretty good across the board. A couple fares in there. And if you keep your eyes on that one on Pages Creek, um, for those of you who've heard these presentations in the past, we've had some issues with uh, Enterococcus levels in Pages Creek over the year. And I'm going to touch on that at the end of this presentation. Spend a few slides on that. But 
Spoke, speaking of enterococcus, this is looking at our long-term results here. There's a lot of information on here, but what you really want to look at, you know, the, the creeks are going across the top, the first column, the years are going on down. Again, it's this kind of high-level whittling down of the data, good, fair, or poor. There's a lot of red if you look at Pages Creek. Mott's Creek had a lot as well. Um, in recent years, it's cleaned up a little bit across the board with some of these tidal creeks, but Pages Creek has remained to be an issue there. And again, I'm going to talk about that in just a little bit. Before I do that, I just do want to move on to Airly Gardens. Again, I mentioned that we've been monitoring three, mon three sites within the freshwater lake at Airly Gardens. Um, we have three locations. One is what we call AG Inn, Airly Garden Inn. That's at the kind of top you can see on the figure there, right up close to Airly Road. Um, there's a culvert and some runoff area that comes right on in that feeds the lake uh, primarily. And then the water kind of moves slowly through the lake to where the middle of the lake is FD. We happily have a, we have a sampling site called Floating Dock, so that's how that got that nomenclature. And then the last sampling site is what we call AG Out, and that's by the outfall that comes right out into uh, Bradley Creek. So, you know, it's a lake, it sits there, the water, but it does have a slow, long residence time where it does move through that lake. So we can actually capture the water samples from these different locations. Sure enough, we can see some pretty interesting trends. So again, we collect those physical parameters, the dissolved oxygen, turbidity, and the like, chlorophyll A, and then those nutrient samples, excuse me, as well. And what we see in Early Garden over this past year was turbidity looked good across the board. We did see low dissolved oxygen where the water comes directly into the lake. Some of that runoff just had low dissolved oxygen in there. And the chlorophyll levels were relatively high for this year. We saw uh, a number of algal blooms, and it was fair at two of the sites, and the floating dock right in the middle was the worst. And on a long-term trend, we've been monitoring in Airly Garden since 2015 now, so we've got a pretty good robust data set under our belt now to really get a good handle with what we're seeing there. And generally speaking, what we see, um, it, it's, in your, it's in the report. There, I didn't include in this, in this uh, presentation. We have a good figure and chart that shows over time the nutrient levels from 2015 until today from the three sites. And sure enough, every year, for the most part, pretty good trend. We're seeing higher levels of nutrients at all three sites coming in. So nutrients is, is becoming an issue there, and we're seeing more and more algal blooms as well. Um, what we're seeing is more nutrients at the front end of the lake where that runoff comes in, and then that nutrient degrades a little bit on a relative scale between the three sites. Um, but then we see the inverse happen, where we see not a lot of chlorophyll in the front end, but then we see more and more chlorophyll coming in on the back end, which really shows it's a fundamental biological process. Plants need nutrients to grow, so we see that nutrient come on in, and then that water basically, or the plants take up that nutrients, and then they grow algae as they go through the lake. So that's kind of the trend that we've been observing over these years. Um, Meanwhile, the county has taken some good pro, uh, proactive measures to try and mitigate some of these effects that we've been seeing. They've done some dredging to remove some of that organic flocculent material that builds up at the bottom where the bacteria can really hang out um, and, and chomp and eat off uh, the algae that dies and take up the dissolved oxygen. That was a really good proactive measure to implement. They also constructed a small wetland in that front portion where that runoff comes in to hopefully have that, that actual marsh or, or, or uh, wetland type plant take up some of that nutrients um, so less of it would get into the lake. They've been good measures, but unfortunately we haven't seen a lot of results in terms of the water quality data quite yet. So whether or not the, the magnitude of the nutrients coming in is just overwhelming or it's taking a little more time to see that response, we'll see. Um, but unfortunately the air qu water quality within Airly Gardens has kind of maintained or persisted with more algal blooms over recent years. So as far as the overall conclusions with the program from this last year and some of these general long terms, again, if you hearken back to that slide I had with all the tidal creek data, again, chlorophyll and, and turbidity have been good across the board this last year and previous years. That's a typical trend. We're not really concerned with those parameters. Dissolved oxygen, as I mentioned, does fluctuate. We certainly see that fluctuation uh, as termed as like a seasonal trend. We see higher dissolved oxygen in the wintertime when the water is cold and the oxygen can really be held in the water better. There's more capacity, just the, the physical nature of water. And in the summertime, we see that dissolved oxygen go down quite a bit considerably. So that, that's a natural thing we do see. And overall, the enterococcus bacteria, generally speaking, compared to 2008 when we've been monitoring, it's improved uh, as a whole within the Tidal Creek. We still do have issues, though, within Pages Creek uh, particularly, and I'm going to spend a couple slides in just a moment on those. And lastly, as I just mentioned, with water quality in Airly Gardens, 
that, that nutrients is really seeming to drive the algal bloom situation and some of the dissolved oxygen issues that we see. So that runoff issue is, is something that we've been probably contending with and need to contend with uh, further. So I do want to shift gears my last couple slides here, and I'll try and make this through quick for you all. I know you have a busy agenda today, but in Pages Creek, we've been having that problem with, the dissolve, with uh, Enterococcus uh, really since we started, you know, 15, 16, 17 years ago, whenever that was. Um, we monitor three stations in Pages Creek, one of which is right near the mouth of the creek where it uh, spills out into the intercoastal waterway. That site has not been problematic. It gets a lot of dilution, a lot of stirring and mixing. So that area of the creeks looked good since day one, but these two other sites that we maintain further up the creek, up towards the headwaters, along in the Bayshore neighborhood, have been problematic. We maintain two sites there. One's called Pages Creek, Bayshore Drive Upstream, BDD, U, BDUS, and uh, Page, Pages Creek, Bayshore Drive Downstream, which is the DS you can see there. And what you'll see on the screen there, it's, it's a picture of the watershed with those two red looking um, polygons on there and with the arrows pointing to a specific area. The arrows are pointing to where we sample for those two sites. The red area is showing basically the branch or that, that portion of the creek in proximity to that sampling site where it goes and spills out into the main body of Pages Creek. I reported to you, I think last year, a little bit about this thermal imaging effort that we did. So we've been seeing these high levels of bacteria in the creek. We've done some studies to do what are called source tracking studies to find out where is this bacteria coming from. Is it coming from canine sources, dogs that are not, you know, people aren't picking up after the dogs. Is it coming from raccoons and wildlife? We've seen geese on the boat ramp at one of the sites, and, and geese, we know what they do in the water, and, and we can see um, images and, and pictures, you know, that they're adding to the bacterial loading in the creek as well, for sure. But we've had so much of this, and, and it's been this persistent problem. The county did invest in, in a couple more experiments where we were able to take the water samples, have them analyzed for the actual specific bacteria and look at the genetic fingerprint to determine what is the source of this. And sure enough, we did see levels uh, that, or the response came back that it was coming from human sources in a certain considerable amount. So after doing a, several efforts of that over the years, that's when we try to figure out, okay, we know that the human signal is in the water, but geographically, where is it coming from? And so we did this thermal imaging study about a year and a half ago where we flew a drone along with UNCW with a thermal imaging camera. Basically, if you harken back to the movie The Predator where everything that moves is hot and things that are cold, uh, you know, so everything that moves is hot and looks kind of red, things that are cold or blue, that's what this does. And it lets us use basically beyond our eyeballs to look for anywhere where we can see any sort of effluent or, or small amounts of water or pooling getting into the lake or into the creek. Um, we couldn't necessarily see this, but this imaging can. And we did that, and sure enough, we did find some areas that were interesting to follow up on, and we took some additional sampling. We did find some areas that were, what we call them seeps on a low tide. You can see some areas adjacent to the sites where we were sampling, where we found that, that human signal, again, coming from the groundwater, coming in, into the creek as well. Um, we found them next to residential property. We found them at, next to the CFPUA's lift stations that are right there by the sampling sites as well. The ones that were just adjacent to the um, lift stations were actually sampled and we found that signal. But what we realized is we wanted to move on to this m recent effort, which we haven't reported to you, at, you yet, and this is in your report today. We kept focusing directly on those two sampling sites, but Pages Creek is a large watershed. So if you look at the figure here, all those little block, uh, blue and, and red and, and, and greenish, yellowish dots show where we took a step back and let, let's do the source tracking within the entire watershed, not just focusing at the spots where we've conveniently been sampling nearby. So we did that in 20 sites, and we did it twice, one during a dry period, one during a wet period. Um, we really wanted to get max flushing when we could as well to see what we could get out of this. And so when we did this, we did this at first in April, and when we did this, this whole area, we only had one area that came back with high level or had some numbers of this human signal. And sure enough, this is a zoomed in figure right in proximity to that site that we called Bayshore Drive downstream. It wasn't at the boat ramp. We have one, two sites, one's at a boat ramp, that Bayshore Drive upstream. This other one is along one of the sides of the creeks where there's a number of homes with, with boat docks and the like, and there's a large culvert there as well, again, adjacent to one of the lift stations as well. Well, sure enough, 
the only area during that sampling event where we had that human signal was right there, right where we've been sampling all along. It helped us rule out the fact that there was this widespread problem where we're focusing geographically in the wrong area. So we were able to hone in and, and basically confirm that this is one of the areas where it truly is a chronic problem. When we visited this area again, or this whole Tidal Creek component again in July, we did the same sampling. We did 20 sites. We actually didn't go back to the sites that were downstream closest to the mouth where we know we weren't going to have that signal. We re reallocated the funds. We put additional sites in proximity to this site. We really wanted to see if maybe it was coming from further upstream. Maybe it's over here. When we did that, we were stumped yet again because now this time, the only area where we had the high signal or we had that human signal was at our other sampling site we've been monitoring all along. And it wasn't anywhere else in the creek. So now we're left back. We did two events. We had confirmation that both sites that we've always been sampling, again, had that human signal. We didn't see it um, at that other downstream site. This time we saw it at the boat ramp. So here we are doing this long-term assessment. We keep coming back each time with this issue with this Pages Creek problem. We have confirmed that it seems that there, this problem is uh, isolated to these proximity to our two sites that are closest to these lift stations and the boat ramp and the like. Um, we were able to rule out that it's coming probably from downstream sources or other areas in the creek. But uh, here we are again, letting you know that there's been this long-term issue in Pages Creek and we're, we're whittling it down. Now there is some news that CFPUA, who has done a lot of assessments to try to determine whether the uh, lift stations have any problems with their structural integrity. They've come back and confirmed that they've done their smoke tests and their closed caption video, and they're not finding any leaks. But they do have a long-term plan to replace one of those list stations within this next year. So our hopes and fingers are crossed that maybe we'll see when that happens. Maybe there'll be a difference there. Um, otherwise, the, the, the saga continues at Pages Creek. So all in all, when these are the sampling sites where we actually did hit these um, positive hits of human, and again, they're in proximity to where we've been sampling all along. So where are we now? We're just gonna continue to coordinate with CFPUA re regarding these sites, and uh, if they happen to go out there and have any sort of repairs or anything needs to occur, we'd like to hear and see if anything actually translates to changes in the water quality. Meanwhile, we'll be definitely looking forward to seeing um, when they change that infrastructure over and they replace it if we see any changes. And meanwhile, we're just gonna continue chugging along, keeping our finger on the pulse and the water quality throughout the entire county. Um, we'll be keeping our eyes on Island Creek as well as development occurs up in that neck of the woods. And uh, that's about it for you all. Is this, when you're talking about, is this septic systems that are? No, so, so the entire Pages Creek watershed is served 100% by centralized sewer at this point. So. Septic had been abandoned probably, if I'm memory right, mid-90s or so. So it's been quite a while. Um, you know, on, on another anecdotal, we do monitoring down in Mox Creek watershed, which is the southern portion of the county. And there was a lot of water, water quality issues with Enterococcus down there for a number of years. Uh, the county moved forward and installed centralized sewer in that neighborhood. All the homes were connected to sewer. The septic tanks were abandoned properly. And I have, there's actually, I think in your report as well, there's a nice chart that shows high levels of bacteria year after year. At 2015, central sewer came in and bam, the bacteria went straight on down. So it, it works when that happens. But strange enough, Pages Creek has been online with sewer for a number of years, a long time. Dan, go ahead. Yeah, Rob, please. Okay, thank you, uh, Brad. First off, uh, you, you have certainly found the uh, fountain of youth. I think in the time that I've been a commissioner, I've never seen you age a <laughs> single day. It's incredible. It's almost like Groundhog Day when you show up. It's, it's the same thing. You can't see my bald you're, you're spot. Doing up something here. right. Oh, I see. Yeah, I'm too <laughs> tall. Nicely done. Um, the, the level that you, uh, your trigger level for inner cockeye. Uh, Bacteria, is it 400 parts per million? Or nope, what, what nope. You so, so Enterococcus, and this gets a little technical, and, yeah. it, and it's in the report. We've got a table in there that shows the various parameters that have state or even EPA standards associated with them, and it gets a little confusing because certain creeks are classified different than others. Right. Pages Creek is what's called SA waters, which is a shellfish water. It's open for shell, or it's, it's designated as SA waters. It has a shellfish resource, so you could go shellfishing. Um, the standard for shellfishing water is a little more stringent mm -hmm. than, than some other creeks. 
Mm -hmm. um, so whereas other creeks have a limited, when you, when you sample, another thing is what's your frequency of sampling. So if you go out there five times a month, mm -hmm. the standard is a little bit lower. It's a little easier to get by. But if you're only going one time a month, which is what we do, mm -hmm. you've got to meet a, a higher stringent standard. So for point being is for shellfish and essay waters in areas where you could recreate or get in the water, there's a potential for so, it's 276 colony forming units of bacteria per 100 milliliters. So 276 is the number there. We had seen in years past numbers in the thousands. We've seen, you know, it, it, it's all over the place, but we do see, compared to other creeks, high numbers. And Pages Creek remains closed, though, to shell fishing, though, correct? I believe it still does today. Yeah. So we're seeing those numbers, the, uh, the 276 be exceeded in your sampling on a regular basis. How do they go from being poor to fare with that continuation, uh, we clearly have a bacterial problem. Right? Yeah, and, and it's a matter of statistics at that point, and it's a matter of the limited number of samples that we have per year. Sometimes when it says fair or poor, you know, it's a matter of if one of the, cre one of the sites, if we had three exceedances versus four, that's gonna trigger you for that one creek, you know, from a fair to a poor. So it's, it's a small nuance. If we're not seeing a lot of green over a lot of years, you're having an issue there. And obviously when you're seeing poor over a number of years. That it, so it's, it's, it's the, the, um, the cost we get for looking at the, the rating scale of just as simple as fair, poor, mm -hmm. and good. Mm -hmm. If you looked at the numbers, you could probably see that it's, it's just been elevated over time. Uh, how does the, these numbers relate to fish? If you're fishing in Gages Creek, for yep. instance. Well, the bacteria is probably not a big issue for the fish necessarily. Dissolved oxygen is probably the biggest driver mm -hmm. for looking at fish and other wildlife that may be there, even you know, small things that you couldn't see or wouldn't really know about, which are the basis of the food chain that are hanging out in there. If you can't have the critters on the bottom thriving, then you're going right up the, the trophic levels and cascading to where the fish, they're not going to want to be there. Blue crabs could move away. Um, snails, any sort of thing, and so it would move on up. And when we do see some of these creeks um, that have dissolved oxygen issues kind of persistently, we just don't see as much wildlife in the creek. But the bacteria is really not a driver for fish health. I, I guess my concern is really the uh, human recreating uh, there, and I don't want somebody to take right. a look at these numbers of these charts and say, oh, you know, great, you know, Pages Creek is, you know, good to swim in, right. you know, good to fish in. Uh, et cetera, you know, it's getting better when we clearly have a bacterial problem yeah. uh, you know, there. Would you agree with that, Brad? Yeah, yeah I would. In fact, um, going back to 2009, I want to say, only a year and change after we'd been monitoring and we, we presented just like this to, mm -hmm. to this body, uh, the commissioners uh, and, and staff agreed that it would probably be smart to actually inform the folks proactively. And a warning sign was actually put up at the boat ramp that does warn folks on this chronic uh, bacterial concern. So that's been there to inform folks who are, you know, there day after day getting into the water. And that sign is still up? That sign is still up today. Okay, good. Indeed. Thank you again. Thank you for all, all your work that you've done. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Greatly appreciate it. If I could um, just piggyback on that, I know Dave might have a different, uh, that was actually going to be my question is do we post that to the public, thank you for bringing that up, and is it inside of the boat ramps and those areas that the public would go into so they could be made more aware of the condition of the water? Yeah, I mean, so folks utilizing, it's a private boat ramp, it's a neighborhood boat ramp, it's not a county boat ramp, um, but the, the, the posting is there, and generally you see folks launching their boats, and when you launch boats, especially when the water's warm, you're getting wet, you're getting splashing around, and you're not going swimming there necessarily, you're not recreating, but you're getting in there. People also launch their kayaks and canoes, and they're definitely getting wet with that. So that's where it's right there beside the boat ramp, is to let folks know. And I think the neighborhood certainly knows, anecdotally, I can tell you, you know, we run out there, we do this sampling, and I'll see folks on the boat ramp, and you know, we're parking our truck, and, and we're going out there, and they see this, you know, guy with this weird equipment going out there and half of them know you know most of them say oh you're, you're doing the water sample they, they get it by now and they always anecdotally so you know how, how's it looking can we go swim in or can we go fish and I'm like well keep your eyes on the data and you know check out that sign you know we let them know um, that you know it's it's not uh, necessarily healthy at this time for human recreating in there but you know I, I leave it at that it, there's no there, there's no warnings or there's no guidance on fishing or, or consuming fish that I know no necessarily mm -hmm. personally I'm not sure if I would but that's my, my perspective. 
Brad, I just want to say thank you for this report. I think that it's very important to highlight things like this, especially because even though there are outstanding concerns, you can see that we've made progress over the years. Mm -hmm. And it's critical that we continue to monitor these things really indefinitely because we do want to make sure that water quality uh, not only improves but can be at the highest level possible. It's a high priority for the county, has been for a long time. Again, thank you for what you and your folks are doing to help us monitor it. We wouldn't know without the information. And we've got to monitor it to get the information. Well, I, I can certainly say I'm really pleased as someone who lives in proximity to one of the creeks and I work in these creeks and such that I'm really pleased that the county's had such an interest on maintaining this water quality and keeping your eyes out. And, um, you know, it's, it's something that brings visitors here, it brings residents, keeps residents here. It's one of the kind of jewels of New Hanover County, I feel. So I'm, I'm really happy that you all have the dedication that you've had over the years. So thank you from, from, a, from a resident standpoint as well. It's just important, I think, for the public to hear that we do things like this, that we're investing in water right. and sewer into the northern part of the county. We understand that there have been issues historically with water, and we're doing everything that we can to ameliorate those. We want people to have the cleanest, best water in New Hanover County. And, and I'm hoping next year I'll be able to come here and tell you exactly what's going on at Pages Creek at some point. We've been talking about this for a while, and we're doing the best that we can do. Um, we just haven't had the definitive smoking gun answer, but we've been looking at every angle that we can, and we're going to continue. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Next is a presentation in the New Never County Resiliency Study Findings. Ms. Rebecca Rowe. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Um, good morning. I'm glad to be here today to present the final findings and recommendations of an organizational resiliency study that several of us within the organization, I'm only the spokesperson today, um, that we've been working on over the past year. While anticipating and responding to changing conditions is and has been a core function of the county's work, this particular effort was spurred by a conversation last summer um, following an analysis of FEMA grant program inequities at a national scale. Um, our county manager, Mr. Coudray, requested staff look into our elevation and buyout programs. And while it was determined that the program guidelines that were in place reduced potential inequities here in New Hanover County, we did find opportunities for greater coordination among the multiple departments responsible for the wide spectrum of resiliency related activities that the county conducts. This study was an effort to develop a framework for that organization wide collaboration. And the context um, grounded the key, the key goals for this project, which include both greater coordination and a focus on ensuring equitable outcomes for our citizens, as well as a focus on place-based resiliency. This study is intended to complement the work that the county has been undertaking for the past five years related to people-based resiliency, but our work was specifically concerned with natural systems, the built environment, and infrastructure, as well as how that impacted our residents. As I mentioned, representatives across the organization were involved in the study's findings, as we all have played a role in place-based resiliency as part of our department's work and cross-functional projects. This does include adapting to changing conditions, mitigating long-term risks, and recovering from specific disaster events. For each of these components of resiliency, staff reviewed current activities, gaps and challenges, and opportunities in order to identify the best next steps to achieve greater equity and coordination. The first resiliency component that we analyzed was around recovery, the phase after a disaster when conditions are stabilized and a community begins to rebuild, restore services, and return to normal patterns of activity. Recovery work really starts in our Emergency Operations Center, or EOC, during an emergency event with the EOC planning section and includes immediate post-disaster efforts to assess damage, stand-up initiatives to provide emergency housing and administer assistance grants um, as needed. It also includes the work of the county to repair any damage or remove debris from county property so normal operations can resume. Much of the work that the post-Hurricane Florence Office of Recovery and Resilience was focused on was on, um, related to this aspect um, of place-based resiliency. And its work is some, 
really representative of some of the challenges that we face um, in this area. The role that the county plays in recovery varies based on the type and impacts of a specific disaster event. Um, it's shaped by state and federal assistance programs that continue to evolve. Um, and it may require high levels of resources immediately after an event, as well as sporadic long-term involvement to manage specific grant cases. From our analysis last summer, we also know that recovery assistance grants rely on local outreach in order to reduce potential inequities because applicants basically self-select. Um, so more vulnerable residents are not always aware of potential assistance opportunities. We do have an opportunity for improvement with the current structure of the EOC planning section, which was implemented after Hurricane Florence, and due to the staff knowledge and capacity that's been built around the administration of assistance grants over the past several years. A framework has been identified for future disaster recovery efforts to take advantage of these opportunities. When a disaster occurs and the EOC is activated, the planning section will develop a recovery strategy that will outline priorities, resources, and measurable outcomes that tell us when short-term recovery has ended and long-term recovery efforts are needed. The Office of Strategy will serve as the point of contact and facilitator of the appropriate subject matter experts and resources depending on what is needed for each specific disaster event. Moving forward, um, staff has identified some key tasks, um, including updating and expanding the special needs registry, as well as a proposed registry for residents with special communications needs in case of an emergency. That, along with an internal vulnerability analysis that has been conducted to help us identify the locations of more vulnerable residents, will inform targeted post-disaster outreach and assistance efforts. An additional task specific to an emergency event will be developed by the planning section um, as part of their EOC role. Perhaps the component of resiliency where existing county efforts are most concentrated is related to mitigation. The actions taken to reduce or eliminate long-term risks to disasters or natural hazards. The county regularly participates in hazard mitigation planning and administers several programs to mitigate risks, including stormwater services, coastal storm damage reduction, floodplain management, and associated development regulations to reduce structural risk to flooding. The biggest gaps identified around this component are related to coordination of efforts regarding funding and prioritization of staff activities, as well as gaps in how information is provided to residents who might be at a higher risk of impacts from disasters or natural hazards. As part of the activities in our community rating system or CRS program, which allows for reduced flood insurance rates for residents in the unincorporated county where the area of our purview is, um, we do send out information each year to residents who are at a higher risk, but there are opportunities for better communication of this information, especially for people with literacy or other barriers. A lot of the information is highly technical and some things can be lost in translation. Much of the work that is being done related to mitigation, both locally and at the state and federal levels, are also things that we can take advantage of. For instance, NCDOQ is beginning work on a flood resiliency blueprint, which will focus on decision making around flood mitigation. The WMPO is pursuing PROTECT grants to fund a resilience improvement plan to address transportation network needs. And UNCW staff have developed a green infrastructure study to identify opportunities to assist vulnerable populations, some of which may be pursued by individual property owners. In, additional, uh, in addition, the Regional Hazard Mitigation Plan is scheduled to be updated in 2026. The staff is already working to identify additional mitigation opportunities through efforts um, even outside of this resiliency study. As part of this study, we have been able to develop an internal vulnerability analysis, which I mentioned earlier, to help with targeted communications, have instituted a framework for regular mitigation coordination for budgetary and our CRS program purposes, and we've also outlined a method for assessing risk, which I will detail in a moment. These efforts will allow us to move forward in coordinating our budgetary requests, expand communications, and identify and prioritize mitigation projects and programs. 
The final resiliency component that we analyzed, adaptation, maintaining and enhancing a community's resiliency in the face of changing and uncertain conditions, has had less of a spotlight in the past, though the organization has still been doing quite a bit of work in this area. This is where some of our development regulations, such as around conservation resources, tree retention, and open space fall, as well as FEMA buyout activities. We have determined that there is a need for more data, more of this monitoring data that, that you've seen earlier to inform our efforts in this space. And this is where the work of local, state, and federal partners provides opportunities moving forward. As part of this study, staff um, did develop a regular plan update process and that risk assessment framework, um, which you've actually seen previously, um, the comprehensive plan process at your August 29th joint work session with the planning board and the risk assessment framework last month, um, as it also informed our efforts um, for our Western Bank study. Um, the regular plan update process, I'll go over that um, in a moment, um, will allow us to plan for long-term changes related to risks associated with flooding, urban heat, wildfires, and other hazards that may increase over time to make sure that policies can be updated as conditions warrant and new information becomes available. And moving forward, additional studies to help us monitor changing conditions and identify incentives for adaptability features will be pursued as part of our planning efforts. So as I mentioned, in addition to our analysis around recovery, mitigation, and adaptation, um, these frameworks and the internal vulnerability analysis um, were developed as part of this study. Um, looking again just at this comprehensive plan update process, um, basically this will help us start planning on a regular continuous basis Every five years after you adopt your strategic plan, staff will begin work on updating our comprehensive plan. Once the comprehensive plan has been adopted, we will go ahead and implement the key strategies to make sure that the recommendations of that plan are implemented, and then we can begin that monitoring. There may be information that comes up that we can address through a regular maintenance amendment, but most of the data we receive we'll be able to inform that next planning cycle. So we are always taking a look at the information that's coming in and on a regular basis, determining how we want to move forward with that new information in place. Informing some of our recommendations is this risk assessment framework. I won't go into a lot of detail because you've seen it relatively recently, but basically we took a look at a variety of different components and identified what the potential risk tolerance would be based on current known risks and based on uncertain future risks to help us begin a conversation on what might be appropriate to do at a county level. For more vulnerable communities, the idea would be to avoid risk as much as possible, both what we see currently and what we see potentially in the future. For communities with more resources, there may be the ability to have a little bit more tolerance of risk so that we're mitigating those risks and not necessarily avoiding them. For private investments, the idea would be is they may be able to bear a little bit of a greater risk um, for future conditions. But for public investments, we would um, avoid any current risk and mitigate for future risks the same way for natural resources. Um, in this way, we can still enjoy what we currently have. People can utilize the resources that are currently available, but we're reducing the long-term impacts. And historic and cultural amenities, um, kind of the same ideas. We would mitigate risk so people would be able to use those resources as much as possible, as long as it was possible. Staff has begun work on the coordination efforts identified in this study and would appreciate any feedback you might provide. And um, please let us know if you have any questions. We do have representatives from most of the departments who are involved in the study here today. Um, and I do um, thank you for your time this morning. Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. Rebecca, thank you for this detailed report. Uh, I'm glad to see that we as a county are always ahead of the curve with so many things. And 
you know, recognizing that although we didn't experience as much flooding as Brother County did or Columbus County did, it's important that we're prepared. Uh, are we members of the American Flood Coalition by chance? Are we going to the meetings and being a part of that? I think Tony McHugh and just kind of leading that effort uh, for our state, I believe. So um, planning department is in. I will check and see what county representative may be in place. And if there isn't one, we, could, we can look into that. And my next question is, why? What, what's the city's rationale for not being a part of the CRS? I am not completely aware of that. I know that they um, are reconsidering that based on my information. Um, there is a lot that goes into the CRS program, and it's one of those things where you have to commit a lot of resources, um, both in terms of development standards, in terms of long-term work, and in terms of communications. Um, we are hoping that we will be able to help with the communications piece, regardless of what decision the city makes moving forward. But based on my understanding, they are considering um, starting work in that CRS program. Is the assumption that this is more of a county issue versus city residents? I don't believe that is what it is. Um, from my understanding, and again, this may not be completely accurate, is there's a little bit of a cost-benefit analysis in terms of what is the benefit for residents based on what it's going to cost them in order to comply. And that does not mean that you can't conduct the regular activities that are going to be most beneficial. It just might not necessarily reduce their subsidized insurance rates. And what are the benefits to the residents if city and county are participants? So, um, the program is designed to provide benefits um, just by the types of activities that they require you to do, um, which includes those development standards, which includes um, regular communications with residents. There's a, basically a list of things that you can engage in in order to be able to meet the standards for the program. Um, I believe the city is engaging in a lot of those things. The benefit directly for residents is that if you live in a more flood prone area, your insurance rates are reduced because of the participation of your local jurisdiction and the number of points they're able to obtain based on these extra activities each year determines how much that flood insurance rate is reduced. Thank you. Mr. Chair. I think that this work is well intentioned. I'm interested to see how it plays out mm -hmm. when, and unfortunately it is a when we have an, a next natural disaster. I, I hope that we'll have an opportunity to evaluate afterward how it worked because sometimes there are unintended consequences that come from implementing any kind of new plan. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that we are in fact achieving the intended result in setting forth this framework. Uh, is that something that we'll be able to get from staff in the in light of this being implemented in the future, here's what worked, here's what didn't, so that we can further refine this if necessary? Yes, um, basically this is intended primarily to be a way to better coordinate. And, you know, as part of our continuous improvement efforts as a county, we always take a look and debrief after a particular occasion to determine whether or not what we have in place worked the way it was intended. So there will be multiple opportunities beyond even you know, a particular disaster to determine, do things a little bit differently in order to make sure that, that we really are moving forward the way we want to. All right, thank you. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Rebecca, thank you for the exhaustive uh, report. I must admit, it, you know, you and I have talked a lot in the past, you know, a lot of discussion about frameworks and strategies and exploration, mm -hmm. et cetera. Uh, it, but I know we need to identify it, uh, what the issues are, and to set up the plan before we trigger the plan. Mm -hmm. There's one area, though, that I'd, I guess I would like to, you to see more specific actions. And the one area that I saw is with the water gauges or the flood gauges. Mm -hmm. uh, I see that we have um, uh, a clearly a need for it uh, and that that's been identified, but I don't see anything in here that says you know, we are committing money or we are actually getting these gauges that will tell us mm -hmm. exactly what is happening. What, what do we need to do to, to get the gauges in the water? And, and so that would be part of the budgetary process. So staff has already met to talk through 
the projects that we kind of have identified at the department level to be able to present them to you in a coordinated fashion as part of your upcoming budgetary process. Engineering has some work around um, gauges that they are pursuing. There are the monitoring studies that were mentioned as part of the Western Bank study that will also be included as part of some of those requests um, in your upcoming budgetary cycle. So we have to wait until June before we can put those in? Well, the first step now that we're working on is identifying the cost of some of these. Um, at that point in time, we could determine whether or not there are sufficient funds currently available to implement that sooner, but we're in the process right now of getting that information together on what the cost would look like. And Tim, I don't know yeah. if you want to. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Yes, good morning. Um, yes, the engineering department through our stormwater services program mm -hmm. has been investigating this with a company, a vendor called OTT o -T -T Hydromet. They provided us some quotes we're vetting it with our IT department because it's actually, yeah. it actually live streams real data back yep. to a cloud source um, server so that we can get live data off these uh, locations. So we're currently vetting that with the IT uh, process. You'll likely see it in the budget for our stormwater services as an enhancement request for next year. Mm -hmm. um, and we could move faster potentially if we can identify some funding um, in this fiscal year, but. Um, we're, we're, we're moving on it, we're, we're moving in that direction. I, I think, Tim, you know, we have so many different uh, conversations going on, everything from the West Bank, but uh, emergency uh, issues that are uh, identified in the analysis that we have in here. Uh, this seems to be a really critical component that we uh, have known about, talked about forever. Uh, you know, I, I would hope that we can get this uh, in so we can get this information because so much comes from what we at this point keep talking about anecdotally and look to you know, satellite imagery and things that are a broad perspective. We simply need that detailed information. We have the equipment that you've now identified to be able to do it. I just want to get it in the water so we can stop talking in broad terms and talk about detail. Yes, understanding. We definitely want to put it in areas to get a baseline before mm -hmm. development gets there as well. So when we talk about Island Creek and Prince George Creek and some of those areas of the north end of the county, trying to establish a baseline um, to know what's there. Thanks, I appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we accept the recommendation that is presented. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Ms. Eckel. Uh, okay, next is the financial update of unaudited financial results for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2023 for the first quarter of fiscal year 2024. Mr. Craver. Thank you, Chair. Commissioners, this morning I'll provide a recap uh, of our financial results for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 23, including our investment holdings and our debt capacity. Then I'll discuss our financial results for the first quarter of this fiscal year, which ended on September the 30th. In summary, the county's finances remain strong. The general fund's unassigned balance is at June 30th, 2023 is at the maximum of the targeted range, and the county's AAA bond rating was affirmed twice within the past six months. As it relates to activity for the year, total revenue in the general fund exceeded budget, while expenditures matched the county's revenue and were less than budget. This slide shows our revenue expenditures for the past three years, with the blue bar being budgeted revenue, the red bar being actual revenue, and the green line being expenditures for the year. As you can see, for 2023, our budgeted revenue came in $12 million higher than budget. Uh, thanks to a high collection rate and a growing tax base, property taxes exceeded the budget by $3 million, or 1.3%. As it relates to sales taxes, property uh, the economy continued to recover from the pandemic and the higher cost of goods, of goods resulted in sales taxes exceeding budget by $5 million, while increases in interest rates resulted in investment earnings exceeding budget by $8 million. Intergovernmental revenue was the only major component that came in under budget, which was largely due to the timing of several reimbursements in the health department 
being received after year end, which we will see later resulted in favorable variance in the first quarter of 2024. As the green line shows, expenditures for the year of $375 million exactly match the revenue of 375, which means that our fund balance was essentially unchanged from the prior year end. You'll note that for each of the three years shown, expenditures came in at or just under budgeted, under the revenue earned for the periods, which represents good fiscal balance. As it relates to the balance sheet, which includes the two hospital escrow accounts, total assets ended the year at $506 million with liabilities of $25.9 million. The difference in those two amounts is the county's net worth, which is called the fund balance, and it amounted to $480 million at June 30th, 2023. As just noted, the fund balance is essentially unchanged from the prior year end. As shown on this slide, 92% of the county's assets are in liquid assets, meaning that they are in cash or readily marketable securities, which is a source of strength for the county. The unrestricted fund balance, which excludes the restricted use escrow accounts, amounted to approximately $102 million at year end. By county policy, the first 21% of our current year expenditures is classified as unassigned fund balance and is generally held in reserve while amounts in excess of that 21% amount are assigned to the, to the county's capital improvement plan and are available for one-time expenditures. The 21% unassigned fund balance equates to having approximately two and a half months of the county's expenditures held in reserves and is a prudent amount to hold for unknown contingencies. This slide shows a six-year history of the unassigned uh, reserve and capital improvement plan balances as a percent of our expenditures. As noted to the right, the minimum in our county policy is 8% of total expenditures held in reserve, and our target is between 18 and 21%. As you can see, after dipping into fund balance in 2019, which is a result of Hurricane Florence, the fund balance was replenished to a 21% in 2021. Its current level results in 5.8% being assigned to the capital improvement plan, the green portion of the chart, which is approximately the same as the prior year end. Next, I wanna provide an update on the county's investment holdings. As shown on this slide, at June 30th, 2023, the county held $466, $467 million in investment securities, with most of those securities being held in the two uh, restricted escrow accounts. Those escrow funds arose from the sale of the hospital in February 2021. Those funds were invested shortly thereafter in bonds that had maturity dates occurring um, one-tenth per year over the following 10 years which is commonly referred to as maturity laddering. <clears throat> With the sharp increase in interest rates that occurred during 2022 and 2023, the interest rates on the bonds purchased in 2021 were lower than the going interest rates in the market. This resulted in the market value of the bonds falling below par value because an investor would require a discount in order to achieve a higher market rate of interest than the stated coupon rate. While these unrealized losses are recorded in our financial statements, they are paper losses only, and as long as we don't sell the bonds prior to maturity, we expect to realize the full par value of each bond when it matures. In the Revenue Stabilization Fund, we have approximately $30 million in bonds that mature each year, and the Mental Health and Substance Use Fund has $5 million that mature each year, both of which should provide adequate cash, such that sales before maturity at a loss should not be necessary. As noted on the bottom of this slide, a benefit of the higher interest rates is that higher interest income realized from the cash and reinvestment of mature securities in the higher interest rate environment has resulted in sharp increases in investment earnings for the county. Before we're getting to the first quarter results, I'd like to provide an update on the county's debt capacity. As noted here, the county had $384.5 million in debt outstanding at June 30th of 2023. During the fiscal year, we made $44 million in principal repayments, and we issued one bond for $22 million, which resulted in a net decrease of our borrowings outstanding by $22 million during the year. Compared to two years prior, the borrowings at June 30th of 2023 were $50 million lower. As it relates to debt limits, the county has three policy guardrails in place to prevent debt load from becoming excessive. The guideline that currently has the lowest ceiling is that our debt should not exceed $2,200 per citizen. 
This results in a total debt capacity of approximately 524 million. The pie chart on the left indicates that at June 30th, 2023, the county had additional debt capacity of 139 million. In October 2023, the county successfully completed a $53.5 million debt issuance to finance our downtown Project Grace Library and Museum initiative. Following that issuance, the county's pro forma available debt capacity is 86 million. Looking forward into fiscal year 2024, we are scheduled to repay $44 million in debt. And with a fairly ha heavy capital project act activity for this year, we expect to issue approximately $40 million in new borrowings. Thus, we don't expect a meaningful change in debt capacity this year from the pro forma availability shown on the prior slide. In fiscal year 2025, we have fewer capital projects on our schedule, and thus we expect a reduction in, the, in our debt balance of around $30 million. Therefore, our available debt capacity should increase back over $100 million during fiscal year 25. Now I'll provide a review of the first quarter of this fiscal year. As a reminder, and as depicted in this pie chart of our budgeted revenue for 2024, property and sales tax revenue accounts for 82% of the county's revenue in the general fund, with $216 million budgeted in property tax revenue and $94.7 million budgeted to sales tax revenue. As it relates to property taxes, the 2024 budget included a half cent reduction in the property tax rate, which followed a two cent reduction in the prior year. As noted here, property tax bills were mailed to our citizens in late July, and they can pay the interest, interest pay the amount interest free until early uh, 2024. Thus, in the first quarter of the fiscal year, collections are just starting to ramp up. As it relates to sales taxes, the county receives those amounts on a three-year lag to when the sales actually occur. Thus, through September the 30th, we've received no sales taxes that apply to the current fiscal year. However, subsequent to September 30th, we did receive sales tax revenues for July and August, which is shown on this slide. As you can see, the, the ta sales tax receipts for July and August totaled 20.9 million compared to budgeted expectations of 20.5 million, which also matched the prior year with an increase from 17.9 million in 2022. Thus, we're off to a good start in fiscal year 24 for sales taxes. The next few slides present information related to county's most significant funds. As it relates to the budget amounts presented for fiscal year 24 on each slide, those numbers are estimated by analyzing actual collection and expenditure patterns realized in the prior two years and applying those patterns to the fiscal year 24 budget. While there are frequently unique fluctuations in the timing of revenue and expenditures in any given year, the budgeted amounts can help serve as an indicator. This slide shows that total revenue and expenditures for the first quarter of the fiscal year. <clears throat> due, to the due to the timing of property and sales tax receipts just discussed, the first quarter of the fiscal year will always have higher expenditures than receipts. <clears throat> as it relates to revenue, and as we will see in more detail on the next slide, we received $56.7 million in revenue in the first quarter of the year compared to a budget of $51.2 million and prior year of $50.1 million. As it relates to expenditures, we have spent 89.2 million compared to a budget of 88.1 million and prior year actual of 79.5 million. This slight overspend versus budget is primarily due to several budgeted expenditures that were paid for early in this fiscal year. This slide provides more detail on general fund revenue. Property tax revenue realized through 930 amounted to 39.8 million compared to a budget of 37.4 million and prior year of 35.7 million. Given that property tax collections are just getting started, it is too early to draw any conclusion, but we seem to be solidly on track. The other revenue category, shown on the right-hand side of the chart, shows actual receipts of 16.9 million compared to a budget of 13.8 million and prior year actual of 14.4 million. The primary factors in this favorable variance relates to the timing of $2 million in state health department reimbursements related to fiscal year 23 that were received in fiscal year 24, 
which negatively impacted the fiscal year 23 budget comparison that we saw earlier. This slide depicts expenditures by government function for the first quarter of the year. While total expenditures are slightly above budget, through one-fourth of the year, the county has spent 21.1% of the total budget. The only function above a 25% spend rate is public safety, which was at 25.1%, and was impacted by budgeted equipment purchases that were paid for in the first quarter. As it relates to the general government, expenditures were impacted by $1.5 million that was made just after June 30th related to one of the workforce housing initiatives and there were two other large payments of a routine nature that were paid in the first quarter of 24 versus a later quarter in the prior fiscal year. As it relates to human services, while it is tracking lower than budget, the increase compared to the prior year is due to Medicaid expansion expenses and fiscal support and bed purchases at the Healing Place, which opened in, fiscal, in February of 2023. This slide uh, relate, shows the debt service fund. Based on lower and principal interest scheduled for the fiscal year, the allocation of property taxes to this fund was reduced in each of the past two fiscal years, which impacts the year versus year comparisons. Expenditures are made according to the repayment terms of the underlying debt and are on schedule. The environmental management fund, which includes the county's landfill, is not tax de dependent. It is a self-sufficient fund that charges fees for the services it provides. The tipping fee remains un remained unchanged in fiscal year 24 after being increased $4 per ton last fiscal year. The increase in revenue in fiscal year 24 is primarily a result of higher tonnage at the landfill with 108,000 tons this year compared to 100,000 tons at this point in the prior year. Expenditures are in line with expectations at 2.9 million. The increase in expenditures from the prior year is due to increases in the operating expenses necessary to operate the landfill. In total, for the first quarter of this fiscal year, the, this enterprise fund's revenue exceeded its expenses by $800,000. As it relates to fire services, virtually all of its revenue is derived from property and sales tax allocations, which are relatively low at this point in the year. As previously discussed, property tax revenues are slightly ahead of budget, which is reflected in this chart, while expenditures year to date are in line with expectations. This is the third year of the county providing stormwater services to the unincorporated county in the second full year a full service charge, a full service fees being charged. Stormwater fees are included in the, in the property tax bill and thus follow the same pattern of result of receipts. As with the property tax revenue, we are seeing stormwater fees track slightly ahead of budget. On the expense expenditure side, as you can see, expenditures are significantly lower than budget. The reason for this is that minimal funds have been expended thus far for two watershed planning studies that are planned, as well as construction of a maintenance shed. The budget column essentially assumes that a portion of those expenditures would have already been made. In summary, this, fund, uh, this fund's operations are tracking in line with expectations. And that concludes my prepared comments and I'm available for any questions. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. We have a lot going on in county government, Eric. Thank you for this great presentation. You know, I, I've noticed that, and I'm, and I'm thankful that over the past couple of years, we've gotten more conservative with our sales tax projections, which I think is truing up the numbers. I think in the past there was a pressure, in my opinion, from the board to uh, uh, rely too much on sales tax. And I think it really pushed the envelope when it came to our budget, trying to true those numbers up. And although we've been fortunate in receiving more monies coming in, we're seeing the economy somewhat shift and those numbers are getting tighter and tighter now. So I will assume that as we go into our budget discussions this year, the board will take that into mind. Uh, looking at our debt capacity, uh, I know we all got calls last week, uh, and I know we haven't had conversations with our school board, but they floated the idea of a bond. Um, how does that factor into what we're talking about? Um, my manager, is it, we had these significant conversations with the school board leadership yet, and just to understand what their needs are. So, um, 
commissioners, I can certainly speak to discussions that staff has had with superintendent and his staff. He intimated that, that it is likely the school board would come forward with a bond request probably for 2024, and, and they understand a primary ballot question is, is not attainable. It could be then perhaps for the general election. He gave no indication of what the dollar amount would be. What I was able to, to glean and shared with y'all in the communication last week is the priorities that we've heard for some number of years remain, um, not necessarily in order, but a teardown and rebuild of Pine Valley Elementary. What was originally proposed as a renovation has evolved, we, we think appropriately, and, and Commissioner Barfield, I, I think you helped lead the charge on this, Rather than renovating Mary C. Williams, it would be a teardown and rebuild. The new capacity outright would be an elementary school in the River Lights community. That, that has been a stated priority for some number of years. And they, they began to talk about renovations at New Hanover, not necessarily to build more capacity, but doing what has largely been deferred maintenance on the school and a resurfacing of something that was expressed maybe 10 years ago and, and that is converting Trask Middle School into a ninth grade center and building what would be a replacement for, for Trask at the what the, I still call the Rock Church property but it, it's where the the SeaTech High School currently operates so those are generally what staff identified to, to Erica and Sarah and I last week's as priorities. The, the superintendent agreed that a joint meeting with the county commission and the school board sometime early in the first quarter of 2024 should be a priority so that you can hear directly from the school board what its priorities would be and, and we could begin to talk in a public setting about what truly is the debt capacity of New Hanover County. The debt capacity should not be, as important as public education is, the debt capacity should not be reserved exclusively for the K-12 system. There are other pressing items. And so I, I don't have an answer on what the size of a school bond potentially could be, but I think I've been able to put some light on likely where you would hear priorities come from the school board. Um, I believe the superintendent is going to be convening some discussions with the school board. Uh, there's an open invitation to us to attend to hear, but I think you'll get some clarity probably in early 2024. Um, there are some dates that have been suggested, four dates in January that we're working with uh, Kim on. I had suggested the later dates. I think she's also gone back to the school system and asked for some potential dates in February as well, just so that there's plenty of chance to get this calendar. Commissioner Barfield, I, I'm not sure if I addressed completely kind of what, what you were putting out there, but that's what I can share with the board as far as what we know. And certainly Eric was there, as was Sarah Worman. That's a pretty good synopsis. Um, the previous bond, was that 140, 140 million or 160? 160. 160. 160. Um, and our current cap debt capacity is what again? 86 million as of today. Okay. And, and commissioners, I, I, I th th that is a snapshot. If, if you went to issue debt for the balance of the fiscal year, you, you would be able to issue about 86 between now and June 30. You will have more capacity in July and, and w we don't necessarily assume there would be any debt issuances of any scale between now and a new fiscal year and or some voter consideration for a, a general obligation bond. Are there any requests coming from k Community College of any significance? Not that I'm aware of to, to this point. The, the president's usually very good about communicating what their capital needs are. I have not been led to believe that anything other than ongoing O&M on the capital side is pressing or forthcoming. And are we factoring in uh, costs for our, our northern expansion with water and sewer? Uh, 
Does that impact anything that we're talking about today? So the, the, the debt issuances that are proposed factor into what the bond capacity is. And now we have been able to buy some capacity um, because of state appropriations that have come in. So today's debt capacity is, by most measures, rather limited. But as the days move into a new fiscal year, there will be more potential. But again, that is not, in our opinion, reserved exclusively for the K-12 system. There are other things that the, the board will want to do and, and candidly needs to do from a statutory perspective. And I think my last question, uh, I know we're looking at building a new fire station. Yes, sir. Uh, how does that factor into our, our debt capacity? Um, so th those issuances have also been considered into what the, the potential is. So everything that we know of that the board has effectively committed to or may have to issue debt in the next half a year has been factored into the, the available capacity. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Chris, whenever you talk about the priorities that were expressed, these are priorities that were expressed to you from the superintendent to our staff. We didn't commit to anything at this stage, correct? No, no, sir, not, not at all. We haven't discussed anything, the five of us, about what our priorities might be. I don't know that we have the data to make any kind of determination up here on the dais. Certainly willing to have dialogue, but we've not committed to anything at this stage. The, the board has not, no, sir, nor has staff intimated that, that it would be supportive. What I... The only thing I can say is that their, their priorities, in my mind, appear to be consistent with what we've talked about. The board did endorse a grant application to the state this spring, I believe, will be two years ago, to work three of the projects that I identified. That's the teardown rebuild of Pine Valley, what now is a teardown rebuild of Mary C. Williams and the new elementary school. The board did endorse a rather significant application to the state that was not awarded. Um, and so I do believe the school system is operating off the presumption that because a board had committed to those priorities that you would be inclined to think those are priorities but no commitment on how they might would be funded and on what timeline. All right. And additionally, I, I think that it's uh, worth noting that some of the data that we've discussed in the past regarding long-term trajectory of students in New Hanover County, that's something that we charge staff with coming back to us with some more information on. That's a really important consideration that we need to have and to consider whenever we're making decisions like this because we do not need to be making bond and building of school decisions for today that may be different than the ones that we'll have in 10 years. Y yes, sir. And um, I, I know the board often receives criticism that, my goodness, the yield rates that staff is suggesting are the yield rates when new development is can't be right. Well, th the facts demonstrate even as recently as Friday that, that you're right. Um, your data assessments are, in fact, correct. While I can't speak to the actual underage, we do know um, best estimate is that the school system's population for the current year is significantly less than the budget estimate. We do know that the future projections for elementary, middle, and high school are continuing to contract as opposed to expand. So there, I, I would never diminish that there are tensions and pressure points in certain school systems as a whole, though, the, the, the school population continues to remain flat or compressed, and a number of our schools still remain significantly under capacity. So it's how the school board chooses to use existing facilities has got to be part of the discussion on what to do with certainly new build. The renovations are important at Pine Valley and Mary C. Williams. Um, in my understanding, and this was a learned fact for me meeting with the school system, the state's model of how large elementary schools ought to be has increased. And so I think while Pine Valley and Mary C. will be tear down, rebuild, the idea is to capture new capacity in those existing facilities. So if it's currently, and I'm making these numbers up, if it's currently 500 students, the assumption would be, well, the rebuild should be for 600 with an expansion capacity well in the future to, to grow to more. So the, the, the philosophy of the state, how to use existing facilities is different, but no doubt 
our student population is not growing exponentially and, and there will be fewer students in the school year than what the board assumes. I think that's an important point. Thank you, Chris. Yes, sir. Mr. Chair, I have, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. just, just a question, Chris. Um, so we did get an inquiry, I believe, over the weekend um, asking our opinion on a possible Bob referendum, which I do not think the county commissioners, just for the public, have been briefed on what the school board is talking about and yeah. what's going to come to us. So just um, if we could get that out to the public, that we have not been briefed on any possibilities of what they're looking to improve or what the bond looks like. I don't know anything about that, which is why I did not respond to the inquiry. But my question to you then would be, I appreciate you setting up that joint meeting so that we can get more informed, mm -hmm. but what is that date that if we should all decide that, that it would be a referendum to be voted on, what would we, when would that be? There is a bond calendar um, and, and I committed to sending that to the superintendent. We'll, we'll do the same to the board. I, so in an ideal world, or I, I guess the right way to say it is the latest you could probably act is going to be in the summer of 2024 to calendar a question um, candidly, it, it would need to be sooner than that. And, and also, uh, um, not kind of relitigating old history, but, but even to put the ballot on the, the, the agenda would require approval from the local government commission. And, and that's exactly why I'm asking, because I remember some instances in the past where it is actually a strict guideline of how a bond referendum gets put on the it ballot. It is, v very much, okay. very much so. So in the event that the voters would choose, and we go that route and it, it goes to the ballot and uh, the voters do um, vote in favor of it, would the county oversee that money or would that money be overseen by the school system? Both. The, the, the way it was structured with the $160 million bond is that the board set up a resolution that required the school system to spend what it said it was gonna spend on specific projects. And it could not redirect the money unless it came back and made a very clear presentation to the county commission and the commission consented to that. So the oversight was very closely guarded by the county commission. The daily management and choice of general contractors and construction management does fall to the New Hanover County school system. How about, uh, is Mary C. Williams gonna be just like Pine Valley where we can build the new school and then tear down the old one? I, I don't have clarity on that. We, we did not talk about approach with the superintendent. Uh, superintendent was just largely priorities. I, I understand I Mary C. Williams is a pretty large space, but it also has serious grade issues. And so I, I'm not sure the mechanics of how that could work. To your point, what I remember from two years ago is Pine Valley would be built mm -hmm. and then the existing school brought down. But, but I don't know Mary C. Williams. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Uh, I just, you know, for clarity and for those who are listening to us, when I say that, you know, the, we talk about school debt, that is actually county debt. It is, yes, sir. You, you, the debt is on your balance sheet, the asset is on the school systems. So it's completely, as you go forward, when we're talking about a, a school bond, we're really talking about county taking on more debt. Yes, sir. Second thing, uh, just for clarity, is that none of this uh, is related to the county supplemental funding funding no, sir. that we do every year. Correct. It's a completely separate um, pocket of money or bucket of money uh, yes, sir. that goes to the school system. It's important as we go move forward about you know the amount of monies that we put towards our school system. Thank you. One thing, and we discussed this, Chris, is before we go spend 50 or $60 million on an elementary school, we need to look and see how much space we got in some other schools that isn't being used. And that goes yes, all that elementary, middle, and high. Yeah, yes, sir. And again, I, I, I would never want to suggest there's not tension and pressure points in some of our schools. But all of our schools are not at capacity. Some are well below capacity and that they should be 
as a professional recommendation to the board in terms of stewardship, they should be used effectively, well and efficiently, but before there's a campaign to build new school capacity that is not necessarily needed. The long-term growth projections do have fewer students in our elementary and middle high school, middle and high schools going forward as opposed to where we are today. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I will say that if you are a board that, that will um, quiver under pressure, this conversation will make you quiver under pressure. Uh, when you talk about uh, changing the makeup of school capacity, which really means busing kids to other schools, uh, it's a conversation that's not for the weak of heart. Uh, because you're going to have parents that will be vehemently upset and challenge you about moving their kids anywhere outside of their neighborhood school. And that conversation is really about neighborhood schools. So for those that are new on the board, uh, I would tell you to put your pressure jackets on because you're going to feel some pressure. Uh, looking at, you know, the future growth patterns of our county and the fact that we're looking at expanding in the northern part of the county, uh, we definitely don't want to be like a Brunswick County, you know, they've experienced tremendous growth. Uh, their commissioners uh, have touted a low tax rate, but now they're facing challenges mm -hmm. because that growth is bringing in more residents than they anticipated. They're approving more projects, and now their schools are tremendously over capacity, and they're trying to figure out just what to do. So we can't be a board that just talks about having a low tax rate and not thinking that growth is not taking place because it is. We, as we, we know that we're trying to grow the northern part of the county. Uh, we know that we're running water and sewer in those areas, and the capacity is going to increase in that area. If you run it, you know, if you build it, they will come, so to speak. And so I think that we've got to be proactive in our thought process and recognize that eventually you're going to need to have the revenues to go with the growth, or you're going to have problems like Brunswick County does. The same thing happened in Pender County when they had a very conservative board that didn't want to raise the right revenue, and they found themselves behind the eight ball. And I want to say they raised taxes by 30 or 40 cents or more to accommodate uh, their growth. And they're still behind the eight ball because they weren't forward thinking enough in regards to the growth that's taking place. At the same time, they've kind of jammed up a lot of developers with development because they don't have the capacity to handle the growth that needs to take place there and recognizing that our county is almost built out. Um, and we just had a great presentation by WBD on projected companies coming to our community. The Chamber of Commerce is doing some of the same work. We're investing in, in our infrastructure here to, to attract businesses here. Uh, those folks have also got to have a place to live. And so again, uh, those things cost money. Uh, infrastructure costs money. Every project that we see now is coming in uh, overbid. Uh, so just want our board to be aware of things cost money and be prepared for those costs if you want to have growth to take place, which I think we've already committed to. Thank you, sir. Okay. All right. Um, Mr. Chair, I'd just like to piggyback on that. Uh, Chris, the, just the, the basic things that you've outlined there, uh, I don't think it's unrealistic to expect a, a request for a school bond of 180 plus million dollars. Uh, just in the, the projects that you've outlined there that have been on the books for a while. This is there are going to be a lot of very difficult conversations moving forward. Just wanted to add to that. Yes, sir. And, and w we did not, as a staff, talk dollar figures at all. It, it was priorities um, to, to include perhaps what the, the county commission could expect as part of the FY25 capital budget, unrelated to significant investments other side, what, what can we also be forecasting to you that would be part of the FY25 budget? And so we never talk dollars, we just talk general priorities and, and very limitedly about the mechanism, i.e. a bond and or the year that it would be, just that it has to be when all precincts are open, so that's going to be in countywide elections, and um, that there is a, a bond calendar that would need to be followed, and, and the fact that 
We've been to the LGC quite a bit in the last couple of years. This is another item that we would have to go back for, and I suspect there will be some questions, and so that probably makes for a more protracted timeline whenever the county commission and the board of education ag agree to calendar it, if you do. Would the school board go to uh, Raleigh with us, or are we on our own? Well, I believe if you ask, they would be in, in tow. At least I hope they would, because the truth is that they more forcefully and emphatically can speak to the costs than the county staff or perhaps the county commission. You know, if, if it is a, a, a bond of X amount to do this work of building this school or that school, that they would be in a stronger position to speak to why does it cost what it, what it does. And you may remember when you attended the LGC meeting at Appalachian State, there was preemptive discussion about requests coming forward, I think for Charlotte Mecklenburg and the granted different scale than us, but the size of that request was um, unimaginable, I think, to, to, to everybody, Barfield just because, to Commissioner Barfield's point, how much school construction costs have increased. Well, as we know, costs have increased dramatically over the last couple of years. That was a significant topic of conversation in Boone, and it's going to be a big number. Those items that you listed <coughs> off, that's a big, long list. It's going to be a big number. That's why I want to make sure that we're very careful, very deliberate about this discussion as it unfolds. Yes, when sir, I was on the school I, board I, of uh, elementary school cost $35 million, it's $50 million now, just elementary. And commissioners, again, just, just to reiterate, your staff made no, no commitments or, or other than that we would work very hard to assemble both bodies so that you could have that conversation. Um, I, I don't think the superintendent and, and his team left believing that we would be recommending to you anything at any point in time. All I can say is their priorities appear to be consistent over the last several years. Anyone else? Thank you, Eric. Okay, let's move on to committee appointments. Uh, New Henry County Board of Adjustment. Mr. Yes, Chair, sir. I'll make a motion that uh, we reappoint Greg Uhl and Will Doobie uh, to their regular positions and Jonathan Bridges as an alternate. All in favor? Aye. 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 Next is New Hanover County Cooperative Extension Advisory Council. Mr. Yep. Chair, I'd like to nominate uh, Dietrich uh, Bloom and Dave Spencer, both eligible for reappointment. Okay, and, and uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Kim, is that, we're still advertising for three more on that one? Okay. Okay, next one is New Henry County Juvenile Crime Prevention Council. Mr. Chair, I'd like to uh, nominate uh, Kelsey Fadden in the business community category. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, New Henry County Library Advisory Board. Mr. One vacancy. Chair, I'd, I'd like to uh, nominate Emily Collin um, for the one vacant seat that is there. All in favor? Aye. 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 New Hanover County Plumbing Board of Examiners, one vacant seat. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, and the Wilmington Regional Film Commission, it got one vacancy and one applicant. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Mr. Manager, you got anything? No, sir. Okay. Everybody good? Uh, just a question. Uh, Kim, are we, I see there's four vacancies on the uh, Juvenile Crime Prevention Council. Are we um, continuing to advertise? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am, we are continuing to advertise. Anything where there is a vacancy and we don't have enough to fill, that we always continue <laughs> advertising. Okay. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd just like to say that uh, we just concluded on Sunday the 29th uh, uh, annual Kukaloris Film Festival, which is now ranked among the top 10 film festivals uh, in the United States. Uh, 
kind of the home base for that, of course, was Staley and Hall, but it's happening all, all over uh, the city of Wilmington. Uh, it was, again, incredibly successful. I think there were well over 100 films that were shown during the course of it. I know at Thaley and Hall we had 36 uh, different films that had multiple screenings, uh, and it continues to grow and to shine very positively on our county, uh, attracting uh, international uh, recognition, but also people flying in from all over the world to watch the film. So just want to congratulate Dan Brawley and the Kukaloris Film Festival. Mr. Chair, I want to wish a happy Thanksgiving to the people of New Hanover County. I personally have a lot to be grateful for these uh, last seven or eight months of working with you all here at the County Commission. Truly has been an honor, grateful to our staff. Uh, just a very happy place to be, and I'm thankful to be in it. Thank you all. I saw something interesting this weekend. It said don't forget to turn your scales back 15 pounds <laughs> Tuesday night <laughs> or Wednesday night. <laughs> Meetings adjourned.